Hello, everybody, and good morning. Welcome, Way family, to your chapter overview. Y'all, we're about to get into the Word of God. And any time that you encounter the Word, you encounter Jesus. So y'all, before we even begin anything of talking about anything in this chapter, because this is an incredible chapter, I just want you to know, if you want intrigue, political intrigue, polit politicians going against each other, arguments, you got it in this chapter. If you need betrayal, friends betraying one another, you got it in this chapter. If you want one of the most gorgeous stories that has ever been mentioned in the Bible, where Jesus himself even has to say this story will be preached throughout all of time, it happens in this chapter. If you want some violence, you need to see some blood, you got in this chapter, an ear comes off in this chapter, y'all. And the first streaker ever to mark the pages of history is also in this chapter. We got our first streaker in the garden here. So we got a lot of action about to happen in this incredible chapter. And uh, so let's invite the Holy Spirit because remember, before you ever approach the Word of God, you need the teacher to be with you. The Holy Spirit is the teacher. We need him to teach us what his book is so that we don't miss any life lessons that Jesus is trying to tell us today. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you, God, that every person right now who's listening and watching today will be completely touched. Speak to them. Illuminate exactly what you need them to hear. And let them ears to listen in Jesus' name. Take over this time. We want to see you, Jesus, and we want to know what you're saying. Amen. Okay, now, watch what I'm about to do. I'm about to open the Bible. Remember, when we open the Bible, God is opening his mouth. Are you ready to hear him speak? Here we go. We are going to the book of Mark, chapter 14. Now, right before we begin Mark 14, I want to give you a couple just reminders of the book of Mark itself. The book of Mark was written in between 55 A.D. and 65 A.D. It was written by a man named John Mark. He was actually not one of the apostles or disciples, but he was uh, the one who accompanied Paul on his first missionary trip that's found in Acts chapter 13. Uh, this was also written directly to the Roman Christians, the Roman citizenship and Christians during that time. So Christians in Rome who had just uh, converted over this was written completely to them. It was a perfect timing, this book. Uh, this is also the first book believed by many theologians, most of them, to be the first gospel that was actually written, uh, which is pretty cool. It's also the most chronological gospel. So the stories and the events, the way they happen, is actually in the most accurate chronological order of the way it actually happened from thing to thing. And that would be important, especially for this chapter, that we'll see a specific event take place. And it's really good to know that it was actually chronologically the way that it took place. And I'll talk to you about that soon. All of the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John, all mention every single story in the book of Mark except about 31 verses, um, which is pretty amazing, which just speaks to how they all worked off of this book, which once again speaks to the fact that it was most likely the first uh, of the Gospels that was written. It is the most action-packed of all of the Gospels. There is more miracles written in the book of Mark that Jesus did, and it has more miracles in it than any other of the Gospels. It's pretty cool. So let's get right in on the action of Mark chapter 14. Now just remember why we do these overviews just real quick. We're not doing these overviews in order to tell you everything and to give you every revelation. We're doing these overviews just to get you excited, get your appetite stirred, get your taste going, get your hunger up for what you're about to encounter. But what we want to do through the Daily Growth book, through everything that's happening, through this group book that we've all written together, that Pastor Marco and all the team has come over, we prayed that God would give you an entrance into his word for yourself, that you would get revelations for yourself. So I'm so excited to just give you some headlines that are going on, but I'm not going to get too deep pretty much on any of this because what we want to do is give you the opportunity to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. I'm so excited for what you're going to get from these stories because you know what we're going to? The death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is everything. Do you know that our faith wouldn't even be faith if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead? Do you know that Paul said 
that if all the things happened in the Bible, but he did not raise from the dead, then this would not be a gospel worth preaching. Because of what we're about to encounter right now in Mark chapter 14, we're about to encounter Jesus, the son who died and the one who rose from the dead. Can somebody shout hallelujah that Jesus is alive? He's alive right now. When I'm speaking to you, he's in the room right now, wherever you're at. The Holy Spirit is there. He is God. And he was sent and taken in the place of Jesus who was in the flesh. And then when Jesus said, I have to go, but I'm sending one who will be here in my place. Do you know that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now and he's praying for you and me? Do you know that without his prayers, some things wouldn't have happened in our life? Do you know that those are perfect prayers coming to you right now? As we open his word, the Holy Spirit knows exactly what Jesus is praying for you knows exactly what is coming down from heaven, and we have an opportunity because our God is alive. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. That's worth shouting about if you're at the table right now, if you're watching in your car. I don't know where you're watching this video, but can I just say, you should give God a praise every day by the fact that he's living and alive and he's interested in you. Let me just tell you how interested he is in you. Psalm 139 says that he thinks about you more than there are grains of sand on all of the seashores of the earth. Do you know that if you get one cubic foot of sand, guess how many grains that is? It's around six million grains of sand. We're not talking a cubic foot. We're talking all the sand seashores of the earth. Do you know in that same chapter, it says that he wrote every single day of your life down in his book? He was that obsessed with your future and your purpose that he went ahead and he wrote your entire story before you could ever do anything right, before you could ever do anything wrong. He formed you and he said that you were awesome and amazing. Do you know no matter who speaks bad about, against you in your life, Jesus has already said you're incredible. He has a plan for you of hope and good to bring you a good future and a good end. Do you know that the most powerful thing that Jesus is for you is your God, your Father, but he's also a friend so much so, and he knows so much about you that he said he's counted the number of hairs that are on your head right now. Oh, there, there goes a couple hairs right there. My God, did you see it? He saw it. I didn't see it, but he saw it. How incredible. Mark 14. We open up with the religious leaders being religious. <laughs> the religious leaders are just being religious. You know what they're trying to do? Kill Jesus. Have they been trying to kill Jesus? Yes. Do they continue to try to kill Jesus? Yes. Do they actually kill Jesus? Yes. <laughs> but it wasn't them. It was God who allowed them to do it. Remember, Jesus was never at the authority or behest of any of these men. It was only him abiding by his father's will. No man had control or power over Jesus. Isn't that amazing? He said, I have to willingly lay down my life. Nobody can take it from me. He even tells Pilate later on, he says, listen, you might think you have the power to take my life, but let me just tell you something. At any moment, I could call down 10 legions of angels and they would come and take you all out. He said, if I had it my way, I'd kind of like to do that because I don't really want to go to the cross. But he says, this is God's will. This is what God wants me to do. So just get on with it. Take me to the cross because you're just a chess piece that God is using right now to get his will accomplished. Woo! You can't mess with Jesus, man. Jesus had it all together. Jesus was no joke. Jesus wasn't playing around. You can't take Jesus' life from him. So this is what's so exciting about this is the only reason he did this, he didn't have to, y'all, but the reason why he went to the cross is because he thought about you, because you were on his mind, because of how much he loved you. He did it because he saw you. The Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. What was that joy? You were his joy. Hallelujah. So we open up in Mark 14, and it says that the days of the Passover were going on, and the leading priests were continuously looking for an opportunity to kill Jesus, but they couldn't do it because they thought that they would be violently opposed if they did it during the Passover. So that's what's going on with there. So we get right into this incredible story right away, though, that one of these women who see Jesus coming, he's part of the Passover, she comes and she is a prostitute. She's an ugly woman when it comes to what everybody else thinks about her. But the Bible says that she comes into the house where Jesus is at 
and she has to push through all of the crowd. I want you to get your mindset just right now. Put yourself in a place where you, and this is how society was, if you were a prostitute, you were just like a leper. Lepers are not able to be around people. They are shunned as unclean. They are people, prostitutes had to be in their own quarter in the city. If they were walking around, people would say, why are you out here? You're like a dog. You're like an animal. You're used up trash in everybody's eyes. Some of us felt like that before we came to Jesus, didn't we? But you know what this woman said? She said, I have something and a gift I want to give Jesus. She had obviously heard Jesus' words. She had obviously heard some of his sermons and already been touched. Because whatever happened and whatever sermon Jesus preached touched her so much that she was willing to go and embarrass herself and not care about anybody else's opinions to press through all of those thousands of people that were surrounding the house that Jesus was in. How do we know there were thousands of people? Because everywhere Jesus went, the Bible says there was an average between two to 5,000 people, sometimes more. Uh, for instance, the story where he uh, has the five loaves and two fish, uh, we see that he feeds 5,000 men, not to mention women and children. So we're talking 10 to 15,000 people in that aspect that were already with him. So there are thousands of people that are following Jesus all the time. So we're talking this woman was getting, can you imagine every step she's taking as she's coming closer to the house? Uncleans. What are you doing here? How dare you show up to this place? Why would you be here? What the heck is she think she is? Who is this person? That's what's going on. She's hearing the voices. But I got to tell you, her destination was already set. The feet of Jesus. Even though the words were happening, even though people were speaking against her, the destination and the GPS of her heart was already set on the waypoint. I will get to Jesus' feet. Can I ask you a question? How determined are you to get to the feet of Jesus? How determined are you to say, Lord, I'm hungry for another touch. How determined are you to get your breakthrough? Jacob wrestled with Jesus. He said he wrestled with the angel. He wrestled with him until he got his breakthrough. Some of y'all are in a place right now. You need to be willing to fight and wrestle and not let go until you get what you're praying for. She comes up to Jesus and the Bible says beautifully here in this chapter that she breaks the ointment and pours it where? Some gospels say on the feet. This one says on the head. She actually pours it on the head of Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus looks at his disciples who are all getting upset. And like she could have used this for, you know, uh, the poor. She could have sold it, taken the money for all this. Bunch of hypocrites. Bunch of people who didn't even know the moment they were in. So many Christians don't understand the moment they're in when God is moving. They're criticizing the moment instead of being in the moment where Jesus is moving. And Jesus looks at him and says, you all need to be quiet. You all don't even understand what's going on right now. She has given me a gift that nobody can take away. You didn't anoint my feet. You didn't give me anything when I walked into this building. But she has now come and she's been sharing and pouring her tears and her perfume over my feet and my head. And the Bible says, preparing me for burial. Pause. This is why it's so important that you realize this is the most chronologically accurate of the books because of this thing right here. When it says that Jesus said that she prepared me for burial, you will notice that Jesus goes straight from her house into the garden and he's then betrayed and taken to the Sanhedrin court, which then take him to the cross before Pilate and he's crucified. Why is that so important? Because the perfume, the ointment went down his head through his beard, into his clothes, saturating his skin. Why is that important? Because he never went and took a shower or bathed from that moment before the cross. Listen to this. When Jesus was being whipped, you know what was happening? They tore the clothes from him, but he still had that smell of a life fully sacrificed to God that was in his beard. He still had the smell of perfume that was in his hair. So every time they whipped him and he wanted to get up and he wanted to call the legion of angels down to set him free. He remembered they would hit him with the whip and he 
but I have to go through because there was a life of someone who gave it all. When they ripped off his clothes and they put on the ground of thorns on his head, what did he do? He would have screamed out in pain. The blood that was coming from the pain that was happening for something he was not guilty of. But why did he keep going? Because when they brought it through, someone gave it all. So I'm going to give it all. When he was before Pontius Pilate, when they gave him Barabbas to the people, even though Barabbas was a convicted murderer and they betrayed him and he was still set free, the pain that he felt of being forsaken from the very people who laid down palm trees and shouted hallelujah, glory to God in the highest, hosanna, hosanna, those same people now betraying him. Why did he go through with it? Because someone paid it all, gave it all. Full surrender. So I want to give it all. How beautiful. Y'all, when you pour your love on Jesus, it means something to him. After this happens and they go from that house, we go into the Passover. And this is an incredible story. You need to make sure. And I'm going to actually read these verses right here. Verse 13. Uh, or verse 12, it says of chapter 14, on the first day of the festival on unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go prepare the Passover meal for you? This is so powerful. Jesus says to them, as you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him. At the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. Listen to those words. He'll take you to a large place that is already set up. That is where you should prepare the meal. So the disciples went into the city, verse 16, and found everything just as Jesus has said. Please hear what's going on. This is the first divine connection that we see. They're all throughout the Bible. But this is one of the greatest ways and greatest scriptures to defining a divine connection. What's a divine connection? It's someone that God has already predetermined and blessed and put in the path of your future that has the exact connections, the exact space, the exact place for God's purpose in your life to be outworked. It's the people that God has put in front of your path that when you meet them, They'll get you to the place you've been praying for in three months instead of you taking three years to do it on your own. It's the people that when you shake their hand, they put you into a place of influence that you could have never gone in because you're not qualified enough or educated enough, but because this person was placed in your path and you met and you followed the Holy Spirit in order to follow Jesus' words, you collided with a divine connection. They're the ones who pay for churches you want to build, pay for ministries that are on your heart. They're the ones who help you connect to the buildings that you need to buy, the house that you need to sell. All of these people, divine connection. God has them in your future. You should pray right now and ask God, say, Lord, I don't want to miss one divine connection that's in my life. You've already set somebody who has the space that I need with the place that has everything that I need to connect to, and they're ahead of me. Lord, I want to follow you so I don't miss one divine connection. They're the ones who help all the dreams that God put in your heart come to pass. Praise God. Let's move on. Verse 17, it said, Jesus and his disciples are now sharing the Last Supper, so they go into this room and... They've now gone into the place where that man had already prepared for them. It was a perfect place. And Jesus is now saying to the disciples, listen, um, one of y'all is about to betray me. It's a crazy statement. Can you imagine sitting there at the table with all these men? And he's like, one of y'all is about to betray me. And they're all like, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And one of the other gospels actually reveals that Judas dipped it in with him. And he, and he said, is it me? And he said, you have said it. So he even tells Judas at the table, he's the one. Wow. At that moment, when he's breaking the bread, and it's pretty incredible, I can't go into it now, but if you'll notice, remember when Jesus, five loaves, two fish, broke the bread, it said he prayed to heaven, lifted it up, blessed it, and distributed it. He's doing it again, but he's doing it now at the table with his disciples. He breaks the bread, he distributes it after blessing it, and he said, this is my body. Beautiful. Communion is one of the most powerful things we can do as a Christian. Once again, it's a whole other teaching in itself, 
But just understand that when we take communion, it's a serious thing. We're declaring when we break that bread, the body of Jesus was broken for me. Do you know that I've seen people by the hundreds? I've seen people who when they finally understand the revelation of communion, the body breaking, the blood being shed, they get healed while they're taking communion. Physical healing, heart healing, while taking communion. It's one of the most powerful things we can do. The Bible gives us a couple things we got to make sure we do. we got to forgive everybody before we do communion. Make sure, don't take communion with the church until you're forgiven and let go of everybody. It's really important. You cannot go into that moment without resentment. It's a sacred thing. Anytime we take communion, it's sacred. Is it uh, that we're actually drinking the blood of Jesus? No, it might be grape juice. It might be lemonade. I mean, I don't know. Whatever you're using, it's a symbol of the blood of Jesus. But make sure that you as a family, I would challenge you, don't just wait for church to take communion. Use your family. Do communion once a month. Do communion with your kids. Put some worship music on for 10 or 15 minutes. Right now, after you hear this word, take some communion with your family, whoever you're doing this study with. Say, we're going to take communion right now. This is so powerful. Jesus did it in the chapter. Might as well do it now. Get some grape juice, get some bread, get some crackers, whatever it is, and realize the power of the body that was broken so you could be healed, the blood that was shed so that there is no pit you could fall into deep enough that the blood could not reach you. Praise God. So they're doing this. Judas gets filled with Satan in the midst of it. Isn't it crazy how all these people, you can be in the midst of a, a move of God. Eleven of them get the message of Jesus. One of them gets filled with Satan. <laughs> the same experience. But what is in your heart? This is what happens when you're in the presence of God. I'm going to give you a little secret. When you're in the presence of God, what is really in your heart comes to the surface. You either give it over to God in that moment or you act and you have to hide and shriek back in darkness and the devil will take over or whatever that area is and whatever you're giving to the Lord, uh, to him. So he had an issue with money. So he's looking at this. He already was tripping when, uh, when, you know, the whole thing happened with uh, the woman who comes and breaks it at his feet. He was so mad, you know, because he's greedy. He's got an issue with money. And now he's like, Jesus, you already told me I'm the one who's going to do this. He even tells him one of the gospels, go and be about it. Go do what, you, what Satan's already had in your heart to do. So he leaves and he goes, and we know the whole story, 30 pieces of silver, which was the exact same price as for a slave in the Old Testament. So now we're going from that Passover and we're walking into the garden. As they're walking on their way, it says in verse 27 through 31 now where we're at, it says that uh, Peter comes and says, Lord, even if everybody else denies you, I'm not going to deny you. And Jesus has to look at him right back in the face and say, uh, actually, you will. You're going to do this a uh, few times, actually, three times before the rooster crows the second time. Peter's like, you're no way. You're tripping, Jesus. All the other disciples come in and they're like, I ain't going to deny you either. All of us will go to death with you. Well, let's see what happens in verse 32 all the way through because they're going to be put to the test. Jesus had already said, but this is an incredible portion of scripture here. Verse 32, it's the story he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. It said he's in agony. He calls Peter, James, and John, and he says, I want you to come and pray with me. And I want you to just be there. Stay up. Don't fall asleep. Pray. He comes back. What are they doing? They're falling asleep. He says, can you guys please get up? I just need you to pray for one hour. Could you just pray for one hour? He goes and prays. What do they come back? They're falling asleep again. He goes three times, y'all, and they fall asleep all three times. And then he says this incredible statement. And he says this in verse 37 and 38. He says, he returned to find them asleep again. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me for even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. You got one of the greatest messages on prayer right there. Your body does not want to pray. Can I say this again? Your body does not like prayer time. Your body doesn't want to pray. Your body doesn't want to lift its hands and praise God because your body is feeling all of its emotions. Your body doesn't want to have devotional time. Your body doesn't want to go on a prayer walk. Your, do your body doesn't want to speak in tongues. Your body, remember, the Bible says that uh, Galatians 5, 17, there is a kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God, and they're constantly in war with one another. Your body, when it's constantly is submissive to its feelings, its desires, when it hungers for food, when it wants sleep, it's not at all into spiritual things, but your spirit, the Bible says, is willing. The word willing means it's actually in total obedience. Your spirit loves to pray. 
your renewed spirit, because remember, when you got born again, you didn't go into the womb of your mother physically and then come out again. Your spirit was born again. Your spirit man, the Bible calls it the spirit man. It got totally brand new. It's called the new man. Your new man, your new spirit loves to pray. Your spirit loves to worship. Your spirit loves reading the word of God. And so here's the deal. Every single day you have an opportunity for whether your body, your flesh, your emotions to rule or your spirit gets to rule. It gets to tell your flesh, you're going to sit down on that seat. You're going to do devotion. It gets to tell your flesh, listen, you're going to praise God right now. You're going to praise him because when you praise him, the throne will sit in the midst of your praise. God's authority will retake over the circumstance. That's what he's saying. The spirit is willing. The body is weak. But watch this incredible sentence. And then we're almost there, guys. It said, then Jesus left them again as prayed before. When he returned, verse 39, they fell asleep again, verse 40, and they didn't know what to say. When he turned to them, he said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But now is the time. Oh my gosh, because now I'm going to be betrayed. Verse 38 says this, keep watch and pray so you will not give in to temptation. Do you know that even though Peter said, I'm not going to deny you, and Jesus said, no, you will, he gave Peter a chance to prove him wrong. What? Jesus gave Peter and all of the disciples a chance to prove them wrong because that is the power of prayer. Pray so that you will not give in to temptation. In other words, it's possible that if you'll just stick with prayer, if you'll stay on your face before God, he through prayer will partner with you where the temptation will not overcome you. What temptation is he talking about here? You know what? You could follow through and not have to deny me three times, Peter. You won't all have to desert me and run away as you're about to do in just a few verses if you would just pray. Everybody watching me. There is a high price for neglecting prayer. A high price to pay for neglecting prayer. You want to pray every day because you need God's help every day. But every day you pray, you get stronger and stronger. It's a compounding effect against the temptations that you hate yourself for falling to. Guilt and shame have no place. Temptation does not rule in a person who prays every day the Bible way they are victorious against temptation. Verse 43, let's keep going. We're almost done here. I can't wait to see what you guys get from all this when you guys are reading these scriptures. It says, immediately Jesus went. Judas now, of course, comes. And what does he do? 43 through 52. It says that Judas comes, kisses him on the cheek. Uh, Peter goes out, takes the thing, cuts off the guy's ear, blood spurting everywhere. Jesus picks up the ear. He puts it back on the guy's head. Crazy miracle. Um, pretty amazing if you would have seen that. And it says the moment that they came to actually arrest him, all of the disciples flee. They all run from him. They flee. Peter, who was talking so much, he's running. James, John, running. Everybody's fleeing. They all deserted him when it counts the most. Why? Well, there's a lot of reason, but let me just give you the, an insight here, an incredible reason. Because Acts chapter 2 had not happened yet. You see, we're all cowards without the Holy Ghost. None of us have power to do what God wants us to do without the Holy Ghost. None of us can understand the Bible without the Holy Ghost. None of us can perform and do. Do you know that every single sermon Jesus was preaching, nobody could follow them? Because they hadn't had the Holy Ghost yet. But the same Peter who denied him and the rooster crowed, the same Peter who denied him three times was the same Peter who stood in the book of Acts chapter 2 after the Holy Ghost got a hold of him, stood out on the steps and preached so boldly about Jesus that 3,000 people get saved. The Holy Spirit will turn you from a coward into a bold preaching machine. The Holy Spirit will take you from fear and put you in confidence, not in yourself, but confidence in the power of God. 
I have confidence in Jesus. I don't have confidence in myself. The reason I can be so confident is because I know how big and beautiful and amazing Jesus is who's inside of me. And because I carry him everywhere I go, I'm not scared of nobody or anything. It's not because of me. I don't got to have big muscles. It's because I know Jesus can handle anything I'm going to face. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is anybody having a good time today? Because I am. Let's get to the streaker. This is awesome. Verse 50, when they come and take Jesus, it said that there's this man. And it said, verse 50, then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Watch this. Verse 51, one young man followed behind was clothed only in a linen shirt. Who's this young man? When the mob tried to grab him, he slipped out of his shirt and he ran away naked. There you have it. We got the first streaker. We got a man coming with some clothes and he runs away without clothes. He's streaking through the scene. This is the only gospel you get to see this guy. What is happening here? Well, this is a contextual thing. You'll have to go to Israel and see this for yourself. But where the tomb is located is very close to a funeral, a cemetery, a cemetery. So what happened was, and you see this in the book of John, and you also see this right here in Mark, verse 62. He says when they come to arrest him, I am. They said, who's the one we've come to arrest? And the king of Jews, he said, I am. He says, when he says, I am, book of, uh, other gospels say that the soldiers literally fell down as if they were dead. Jesus has to wait for the soldiers coming to arrest him to get up back to their feet. He has to wait for them to get back up. And so they can arrest him. Can you imagine Jesus there? Everybody's on the ground, just laid out. And Jesus just like, well, I'm just waiting for y'all to get up so you guys can take me. We got to proceed here. We got to proceed. <laughs> so then they get up and it says that at that moment, all those soldiers fell down, but one man rose up from the grave. Holy cow. See, they were wrapped in linen cloths. In the cemetery, one man rose up from the dead when he said, I am, because the I am has the power to raise the dead, dear Jesus. If you're shouting over there, that's fine because I'm hardly containing myself right now. That's the God we serve, the I am. Hallelujah. Man, if I could talk about that, I could talk about it all day. But Caiaphas is questioning Jesus now, verse 53 all the way through 65, and he gives the whole speech, and Jesus says, listen, I am, in verse 62, and you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. So he's speaking to the Sanhedrin for Caiaphas, all this. And uh, he says that they rip their clothes. They get all upset um, because he's a blasphemer. They start slapping him in the face. They put a blindfold over him and say, tell us who, who, who's with you. Prophesy to us. Get a word of knowledge. So that was pretty terrible. We're beginning the places where the blood was shed. There were seven places the blood was shed. In the last nine hours before Jesus went to the cross. Come on Good Friday service and you'll hear about him. Praise God. Uh, verse 66 all the way to 72. Let's finish it here. Jesus denies him. The rooster crows. And verse 72 is so incredible and sobering. It says, and immediately the rooster crowed the second time. This is after Peter denies him again and again and again. Suddenly Jesus' words flash through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times and not even know me. And he broke down and wept. And y'all, that is where we're at in chapter 14. We have to pause right there. The action is going on. Jesus is already sacrificing things for himself that he doesn't deserve. And he's doing it for you and me. Guys, don't miss next chapter overview. Because the action continues as Jesus continues to perform these amazing things for you and I. Let me tell you something. You can never read the story of the cross too many times. You can never be familiar with what Jesus did for you too many times. Remind yourself all the time because this is the greatest act of love that anyone has ever done for you. And the more you remember what he did for you, the more you'll be empowered in every area of your life because the cross, listen to this, has the power. The cross is the power over temptation in your life right now, but you just got to get a revelation of the cross. The cross is the secret and key you need for your marriage right now, but you got to know how the cross applies to your marriage. The cross is the key that you need for your family coming back together, for your brother to be saved, for people to be helped, but you got to know how to pray through the cross. The cross applies to every situation in your life. 
Do you know how to use the cross? We love you so much. God bless you. Jesus bless every person that is on this and listening to this overview right now. God, as they study this week, give them insight, give them revelation. God, through every day in the daily growth book, every question that they ask, God, Holy Spirit, be involved. I think you're going to change people's lives because what you did for us was the greatest thing we could have never even asked for. Jesus, you're more than we've ever hoped for, and we love you. Thank you, Jesus, for being in our hearts, for dying on a cross and giving us power today to reign in life. That's also your Bible. God bless you. Have an amazing rest of your day. Get in God's presence. Do some communion this week. Love you.